I know everybody's been talking about Deion Sanders taking a head coaching job at the University of Colorado. And um, what had, you know, it's been a, uh, everybody going different directions in regards to, you know, how can he do it? It's not fair to the kids. You know, maybe should, he should stay longer uh, to help the school and everything. I got a whole different take. Because I remember a couple years ago when Dion got a head coaching job at Jackson State University. And it was none of this fanfare and hoopla like what's going on now. You had a ton of people that were, you know, from the school, at, at the school, and alumni wondering, you know, why would they do this? It's kind of like a mockery. Uh, would he be successful? Uh, you had a lot of established, probably more credible coaches that had been coaching, you know, even in HBCU ranks. Uh, years and had more experience coaching than Dion, and they just gave him the job. It's like it was just maybe like a celebrity move or something like that. Nowhere near the fanfare, nowhere near the people opening, you know, opening up their arms like they are now. And uh, to be honest with you, that's that's probably true. And it's kind of the same thing what's going on now with them going to the University of Colorado uh, with no major college football experience, even though he's played like pretty much most uh, college coaches have. He's played, he played in pro, pro ranks. But he has no major uh, college experience, you know, and I think that's used to go from, you know, you're talking about H HBCU uh, to a Power 5 job, huge jump, and I don't think, hell, I can't think of any coach that has done that before. But I do remember a couple of years ago, there wasn't this big attention. So I wouldn't necessarily say that was a job that nobody wanted, but it definitely wasn't a job that would be enticing to a lot of, you know, big-name coaches to come to Jackson State, right? That's what I'm talking about. But Dion took the job, and with that said, I think everybody had a big win-win. For the simple fact that um, you, the school got a coach that brought a lot of notoriety, brought a lot of success, and brought a lot of money to the school. And it, they took a chance on a guy that didn't have a lot of coaching experience at the collegiate level. Hey, hell, they didn't have any <laughs> coaching experience at the collegiate level. Had some success and able to turn a lot of things around. And he was able to use it as a, a springboard because uh, I don't think – I think if Dion was able to get a Power 5 job initially, say the Florida State or something like that, he wouldn't want to Jack State anyway. So he did what he had to do to be able to put himself in the position. And the school had a good win by, you know, taking a chance on him. And it worked out okay. I don't think it was the issue of being of, of longevity. I think that's coach speak. Having a, uh, a child that played Division One SEC ball, um, when you have those coaches come sit in your living room, I don't care who it is, they're always going to, do what I call coach speech, where they're going to say, hey, I'm uh, this is my dream job. I want to be here. Uh, every kid that is getting recruited, them and their parents go going to hear that same thing from any coach. But if the right opportunity comes, they're going to leave. That's just simple progression, right? And the person that is that takes your kid to college as a recruit to coach them up, they're going to teach them to uh, progress, compete, and also take that upon uh, themselves in life as well. Um, a lot of times people um, – aren't you know happy when things don't go that way but I, again you, you look at what Dion did and I thought this is a, something for a lot of people to look at he gave you know HBCUs a, a blueprint for success you know he, he, he went to the transfer reporter did some unconventional things and he was able to bring talent in and you know be successful but by no means let's be realistic he didn't beat any of the big boys he didn't beat uh, Alabama, he didn't beat Georgia, he beat, you know, other HBCUs. He had success with it, using that blueprint. And I think that's a blueprint in regards to getting money from donors, getting money uh, uh, from uh, uh, local local officials and even businesses in the area to grow it. I think any HBCU can do that. They can bring in an instant talent with a transfer reporter and turn their whole programs around. And I will say this, when we start talking about being a pawn or sell out of things like that, you're not finna damn tell me that no coach at Alabama State, if they get the phone call, they're not going to uh, the University of Alabama or Auburn. You're not telling me a coach that is at Florida and assistant coach at Florida a and is not going to go uh, around the corner to go to Florida State. I mean, you, you just can't tell me that. Now, you might got somebody that be maybe entrenched at a school 15, 20 years, and they, they're there, those exceptions. But most of your coaches, they're not going to do that. And, again, there was not – again, you, you think about it. When Dion got the job, there were so many other qualified black head coaches that he got put ahead – that he, he was hired in front of. There was no – where there was some talk about it. But now you're sitting there looking at it's a lot of black assistant coaches at the Division One Power Five level, some, D, uh, some coordinators and everything. That probably should have been considered for the Colorado job before Dion because keep in mind – Dion still 
has not coached at that level. So he superseded all of them. It's just basic progression. And I think a lot of times people don't understand, when, you know, even in, 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 at the HBCU level. And I just know this just with having a conversation with coaches. They'll play college football, but just having a conversation with coaches. A lot of times you can, and just even though I'm uh, – from a, a corporate America standpoint, sometimes you can get locked at that HBCU level, and it's not a knock against or anything like that. And you may have big aspirations, kind of just like if you may be a women's basketball coach at a collegiate level, even a pro level. You may want to progress, but you kind of pigeonhole in, like you, you can't really get out of that. And when you get opportunity to progress, you're going to move on it. It's the same thing if you're coaching uh, Division Two, you're coaching at the F- FCS level. If you get an opportunity to coach higher you just going to move on it. That's the whole point of progressing. The whole thing of it is in terms of when we start talking about, um, uh, you know, kids graduating this for the kids and stuff like that, if a young black man graduates from HBCU and if a young black man graduates from a PWI, the end game is to get them to graduate. I always felt. So if you got an opportunity for them to graduate, you're still winning. I'm, I'm, that, that's just my personal opinion. You know, again, my whole life I went to all black elementary school from uh, uh, inner city of Atlanta. I went to all-black elementary schools, all-black high schools. I did my undergrad at PWI, did my grad school at PWI. At the end of the day, the paper to paper, right? So we can, you know, of course we want to, you know, it'd be great if he could stay there, keep the fanfare going. But, again, I, I, I can't see any other coach that had the same opportunity, the same position, they wouldn't do it. You know, so we can say what is swag or whatever. I guarantee most of them assistant swag coaches, given the opportunity, they will leave too. Right? Because, like I said, it's all about progression. The key, again, is the blueprint that he gave. If you had HBCU level coaching and everything, even with HBCU graduates, I always remember even just going on those recruiting trips with my son, how you would go into these different stadiums. You, you see these family names that donated and donated. It, you can't tell me that each H, most HBCUs, they, with their alumni base, you can't get 100 people to donate $10,000. I'm not talking about the 10 to 20 check people. You can't tell me with UD schools that have been in uh, running for over 100 years, you can't give each one, for the most part, you can't get 100 alumni to donate $10,000 with the thousands of people that have graduated over the years. But that's not going on. And if you can do that on a consistent basis, you will need to uh, uh, ask people for money, do things like that. Dion, the most important thing that I thought Dion brought to HBCUs, he asked one simple question. I thought this was super, super important. He said, why not? Why can't we have these? Why can't we bring the money in? Why can't we uh, be on TV? And now at the end of the day, those are, because when you limit yourself and you stop stuff and you say the word can't, and it was always just inevitable that HBCUs couldn't be on ESPN. They couldn't get it kind of funded. They couldn't get uh, above standards or premium facilities and things like that. Deion said, why not? And at the end of the day, when you ask that question, you demand those kind of things to happen. There's enough money from HBCU alumni to demand that. There's enough opportunities in the community to demand that and put into it. And that's what he did at Jackson State. And you can do the same thing at any other HBCU. So at the end of the day, people will come and go, but the school is always going to be there. And I just feel like what he did was enlighten and inspire a lot of people to, to you know, especially, you know, other HBCU to do the same thing. Again, you know, it wasn't like, I keep going back to it. It's not like they had this major success against the big boys. They beat other, they beat other HBCUs, right? The blueprint is the blueprint. Get some other talent into the transfer portal. Get some, get one or two uh, surprise kids here and there. Get the community buy-in, get the alumni sense some money. I think you can have a lot more success instead of just saying we can't, we don't have, right? That's one of the things. And they did that without putting their kids where they had to pay, you know, play one of those major schools and get a lot of kids hurt and everything. They didn't go that route with doing it. So I'm just saying there are things that can be learned from this. Because, again, he got what he needed to do to go to the next level. And I'm going to be honest with you. I think if he had success at Colorado, I wouldn't be shocked if he leave Colorado to go to another a, a, a bigger program, that's his. This is his entry into that. He wasn't, you know. I don't. I don't necessarily know if he was. Uh, may have had interest from SEC schools or maybe a, a, a top tier SEC school or a top tier Big Ten. You know, even though uh, I think Colorado's in the Pac-12. Um, 
uh, they're in the Pac-12, but I mean, and that's still FBS school, but I don't, they're not, you know, USC, UCLA, you know, that they're not that. But again, I think that is a stepping stone for him. And I think the brother looking at, okay, this is the opportunity. He does a good job, gets good staff, self promotion and everything, bringing, you know, uh, uh, good kids in and everything, I, talent rather. So, you know, I think anybody can learn from it. But to sit here and look at, you know, this is not good, you know, you know, HBCUs need this, that, and that. HBCUs need to take care of HBCUs. And if you do that, like, again, you have enough black excellent, black talent out here, and a lot of black money out there that come out of HBCUs. Put that money into your school, into your schools, and trust me, you can see similar results at the end of the day. Because there are a lot of, no doubt in my mind, capable and able and competent young black coaches that can coach at HBCU level, that, you know, they, they can do that with the right tools. You have to have the right tools. And tools come with money. And I think you, you don't have to go ahead and ask for certain things and say we don't have the certain things. you got enough HBCU uh, alumni that can put in to get certain structures in, okay? Is everything fair? Is everything equal? Absolutely not. But I think at the end of the day, you don't necessarily need to be equal to be competitive, okay? You don't always have to be sitting there looking at, and, and just don't, you know, want to make, you know, certain things uncomfortable to get there. That man did that in two years. He did that in two years. And he got there, like I said, I'm pretty sure Jackson State is glad with what they were able to get from, from that gamble because, again, it wasn't the most popular choice with him getting hired because there were a lot of other brothers that probably should have got the job before him, just like, again, at Colorado. But they, they took a chance on him. They had success. He went there, paid his dues, had success, move on to the next level. And I think he's leaving Jackson State in a much better place than what he came, when he came there, okay? And I think they'll be fine, and I think he'll be fine. And I think everybody else will be fine if they focus less on – him going and focus more on what they need to do going forward and stuff. That's just my take on everything. Wishing everybody the best look. You guys take care. Or make sure you leave your comments below. And make sure you subscribe to Change the Live, hosted by your truly Deontay Burton on YouTube. Take care.